you're listening to Force Majeure, an actual play Star Wars podcast. My name is Adam and I'm your host. And today's episode will be brought to you after these words from our sponsors. Why have the same view out your window every day? Come to Port Haven. Port Haven. Our cozy resort has everything you need to relax. Port Haven. Why not start your day with an adventure? Let one of our friendly droid guides take you on the safari of a lifetime through unspoiled jungle. Port Haven. See what our wildlife has to offer. Then relaxed with a zero-g massage from one of our famed Doug masseuses. You'll be amazed at what the The Imperial Admiralty Board regrets to inform all holiday makers that Port Haven is currently closed for business. We apologize profusely for this inconvenience and we'll be offering a full refund for the price of any tickets purchased to this interesting holiday destination. Simply report to your local Imperial Security Bureau office with your name, chain code, and details of your trip, and you will get the recompense you require. Once again, the Imperial Admiralty Board apologises for this inconvenience. Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Adam and I am the GM for episode 19 of the Coldfire Chronicles. And I'm joined around the virtual table by... Hi, I'm Mim. I play Lassa. She is a human sentinel artisan. Her emotional strength is her curiosity, but her weakness is obsession. And I've just killed a man in cold blood. Hi, I'm Mikey. I play Jiren. He's a Chiss mystic advisor. His emotional strength is his enthusiasm... And his emotional weakness is his recklessness. And Duran has never shot anybody in the face. Hi, I'm Ross. I play Agatha, a Morylan warrior aggressor colossus, whose emotional strength is his pride and whose weakness is his obsession. And Agatha hasn't shot anyone in the face either. Punch them. And, and also someone who, who almost certainly has shot someone in the face to bookend this neatly. Hi, my name is Ed Fortune. I play the character currently known as Oberon Brick. He is a human, he is an Atoru striker, and he is a seeker. His emotional strength is justice and his emotional weakness is cruelty. And he has indeed shot people in the face. But mostly he goes for kneecaps first. And I think rather than any questions, we are just going to get straight back into the action. We rejoin our heroes in the Huskow. Gathered outside the bars to the cell, where Lassa has just shot the unconscious Bosco in the head players. Oberon stands up, goes over to a locker, pulls out a body bag. Jiren hasn't moved. He was turned round and was, was talking and his expression hasn't changed either. He's just still looking directly where Oberon was. It looks like he's trying to work out what's going on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect this computer from the bounty site so no one can look that up and work out who we are or what we've done. And I'm going to give Lars the access codes for this place. If we leave the body here, then he can collect the bounty on it later. And we can go deal with Bosco's friends. Lasso? Yep. If I turn round, how's Bosco? Stable. Oh. Oh. I didn't think we were that sort of crew. Well, we're not. I mean, I trust you. Lasso, can I make an assumption? He says, whilst... Literally doing the dirty work. This place is very dear to you? This whole place? It's very dear to a lot of people. And you can't allow part of Port Haven to happen here? I cannot. Agatha, can you help me with the head, please? I'm going to. Uh, Agatha is very subtly reaching towards... Last, not not to t- ask to take the weapon off her, but just to make sure she doesn't fire any anybody else with any sudden moves. But he's also going to sort of exhort some force to make sure it stays pointed down now. She doesn't resist. There's a slight hint of shock, but at the same time, it's it's almost as though you can see a whole change coming over her. She's happy for the gun to be down, but there's there's no regret 
in that shock. There's very much an acceptance, but it's it's not been worked worked out completely yet. It's just a we now have to get on to the next thing because there's something else to do. Very much like she is when she's taking care of various different parts of the ship falling apart. She doesn't stress over any one particular thing because there is a whole ship to look after and she just moves from one to the next to the next to the next until she can then start being entertainingly irritated about minor things that need to be dealt with. Yeah, Agatha's not saying anything out loud because he's been sworn to silence about anything, any upset that she may have experienced recently. But he's also not moving immediately to follow Oberon's instructions because he's waiting to see what she does next because he's, in a way, he's been there. I mean, he's not been there for a long, long time, but he's aware he's been there. So, Jiren slowly turns around and takes in the scene. Okay, probably not. This is going to take some time to get... Mm. Okay. Jiren, we don't have time. We have got to deal with his friends and we have got to get off this planet. Okay. Larsa, this will mean nothing to you right now, but when you look back at this moment, remember the reasons why you did it. Do not dwell on this. Do not revel on this. This is just a thing that had to happen. She nods. And at that point, I clean up the mess and like, I make sure that the mess is cleaned away. I mean, the upside of blaster bolts is... It's kind of self cauterizing in a lot of ways, but there is there is certainly the carbon scoring on the floor and consequences of death. The body has gone into a bag. The, the mess is being in the process of being cleaned up and, you know, in a minute's time, he'll be faffing with the label. Before the bag is closed, Duran snaps his, himself out from staring at where the gunshot was. Because, well, one second reaches down, reaches into the bag and into where Bosco's arm is, and he unclips a little bracelet. And he holds it up for a second and then passes it to uh, to Lassa. And on the little bracelet, there is what looks to be just scoring. It's, it's a thick leather thing. There's just scoring. And there's dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of, of, of lines. You should keep that. That is how many people he has killed. All right. She takes it and she tucks it in a pocket, but she's not particularly... No, no, I don't say you should wear it, but if ever you feel bad about this, Bosco was not a good man. I don't think it's the way I would have liked him to have gone, but he is a killer. He has killed a lot. Okay. Larsa, someday it'll be up to you to decide whether you want to keep that as a trophy or if you want to throw it away as a bad memory, but not now. Not now. No, 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 it's not a trophy. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes. It is not a yes, trophy. What that is, is a reminder he is a bad man. Yes. It is not a trophy. It is a reminder. We don't have a time for this conversation. We need to deal with the other problem. Well, do what you need to do. Does this cell have... I mean, if this cell's been used by you know, for to keep drunks locked up and everything, I assume there's some easy way of washing it out with... Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's a mop and bucket in the small kitchenette... It's not a Prinkle mop and bucket, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, he... <laughs> Prinkle has seen it and sneered at it. <laughs> that is the most rubbish mop and bucket. But we're not involving the hero right now. No, he's off being kept far away and innocent from this. Oh, we have all noticed that Larson made sure that, that Prinkle was not in the room. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> Can I ask a question, though? I cannot remember, because something has happened recently that's made it difficult for me to focus. Do we say for Prinkle to come back here? Can we make sure it doesn't look like there has been a murder as best we can? Because when he comes back here and he sees the cell is empty and there is a blaster on, he will, um, there will be issues. So after about five minutes, there's literally a body where the bodies go in a body bag and the cell has been cleaned. There isn't anywhere for the bodies to go because this is not that kind of place. It's not got a mortuary. There is the office with a bit of a kitchen in it, a fresher, and then the cells. But you do have Prinkle's com code if you want to redirect him, though. Yeah, I think we should. Meet us at the gambit. Meet us at the gambit. Here, it is, here is where it is. Lars will look after you. You know, that, that is absolutely within your your gift. One of the discouragements of prison is, you know, you don't want to be locked in the cell with the dead guy. So we'll move the cell to one of the, the body to one of the cells, and the other cells are allocated. Yeah, there are four cells, so you could just move him out of the one he was into one of the other ones. Doesn't make a difference, they were all empty. Jiren, you said you had a few things that need doing. Do they still need doing, or have they been done? 
Well, I've been here, so they haven't been been done. All right. What, 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 where did you think I went to do it? Before or after you shot him in the no, head? No, I was just checking whether the things were still relevant. Yes. All right. Bosco is nothing. Bosco is my past. This is my future I'm looking at, and I still need to have them done. All right. So you should get on to that, then. No, we're going to go and deal with his crew, and then I will do it after we have done that. We're going to do that first? All right. Yes, you were saying there is no time. Let us go and do this. All right. Right. Computer system sorted. Yep. Uh, we'll make sure that Lars gets the code to come collect the, belt, the uh, body for the bounty when we leave. As in, when we leave the planet. Okay. Agatha's is going to put a hand on her shoulder, because I think she needs... I think she's focusing inward at a lot of the minute, and we might need her to be, you know, paying attention to the water around us. He's catching up with her, but... Okay. Right, I'm ready. Let's go. Well, you know where we're going. Uh, lead on. Okie dokie, then. It's outside the city limits. Is it walking distance, or should we hitch a ride? It's walking distance. It's about an hour walk. This whole side of the moon that you're on is effectively a huge scrapyard and dumping ground. The forward side of the planet, because it's tidally locked, is effectively a, a shield for the rest of the planet from the asteroid field that, uh, and meteorites that you're going through. The stopover itself has a number of massive ray shields over the main habitation bits. And then there are plenty of smaller ray shields around the various landing pads and slightly out of towny bits. And there are airlocked tunnels that lead you kind of in and out of the, the various scrap mountains that are around. But there is an atmosphere on this planet. It is, when you leave the scrapyard itself, um, there's the stopover, like the main central bit, and like leave the ray shield. There is breathable air and atmosphere. It's just a bit colder and the air is a bit thinner, but you don't need any special protection to go out there. You basically go deeper into the, the scraplands and head out. You can get a lift off one of the various kind of hover taxis if you'd rather do that than yomp across town. Yes, I, it's pro- probably more inconspicuous to just yomp across rather than uh, have a taxi with several bags of weapons. I suppose that does raise the question, Ed, is Oberon's rifle assembled or are you going to break it down and put it in its carry bag for the walk across town? As we've been told that we're about to go on a murder, which is how, how Oberon's thinking about it rather than a hunt, but he has his rifle up and out because they might still be coming. He doesn't think they are, he thinks they're, they're hiding, but he's, um, he's on edge. He's very much on edge. He's like, you can tell from his body language that he is not happy. Okay. So yeah, you yomp across town. You do get a few looks from people kind of in passing, partly because you're carrying this huge rifle as you're walking through the streets, and that is pretty unusual. Most people that are visibly armed, it tends to be blasters and hand weapons and lower end melee weapons, you know, fibro knives, that sort of stuff. There is one Wookiee that you see who's currently doing some window shopping that has a truly unfeasibly large Final Fantasy-esque sword across their back. It doesn't even look like it's a, it's a vibro sword. It's just a huge chunk of metal that, that someone who is very strong can swing around. But most people are like... In fact, it's a lot of it's slug throwers, like slug thrower pistols. The other reason that you get a bit of looks is because, again... Agatha's legend has spread a little bit in the day since the fight but most of the looks that you're getting Agatha are quite respectful nods you know you put up a good fight you dealt with a dangerous criminal who is no longer causing a problem yeah well they don't know the full extent of that yet but <laughs> yeah so the nods that you're getting are, are fairly respectful nods once or twice you get stopped by a couple of people who just want to shake your hand and congratulate you on the fight and and ask if you're going to be, you know, getting in the arena again, like for this upcoming weekend when there's another title bout coming on and, and that sort of thing. I am non-committal to my appearances at yeah. this stage. I kind of imagine that it's unusual for Agatha to be approached by people who are quite positive him. I mean, it's unusual for him to be the one who's approaching the group. He's used to somebody else in the group being the one who's approached because he's not the one in charge. This is feeding his pride a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, you are the one that people are coming to talk to, really. And... You know, you do get a few kind of, hey, great fight. One kind of person who's who's running a food stall quickly runs over and hands you a couple of what look like wob rat kebabs. And then, I want a load of money on your fight. On the house, on the house, thank you. And kind of goes back to the stall and... Cool. Norms. 
But eventually you exit the main body of the stopover and you get out to the largest scraplands. And yes, once you're out from the race shield that's overhead, for one thing, the sky is a lot clearer because it's not coloured by the protective shield. And you can now see the little bits of celestial debris and like high velocity nuts and bolts and little bits of asteroid, of, of meteorites kind of whizzing overhead as um, the moon the stopover's on continues its way through this very busy bit of space. Above you and around you tower the scrap piles and there's crashed freighters here, there's wrecked starships there, there's broken containers and freight transportation bits there. You can see one pile that looks like it was at some point a battalion of battle droids that have all just been fused together almost and melted into one almost artistic sculpture of broken droids. And finally, you get to where Lassa has been pointed out that the gang are hiding out. So whereas Oberon was very tight in the town, he's gone into full stalking mode now that he's outside the town, if you see what I mean, because now he's like, he can do his job. He's still like very scowly, shall we say, I mean, kind of deeply unhappy. And I, I look at the target through the scope and see what we see. So the point that's been identified is buried in the scrap. And if you didn't know what you were looking for, you probably wouldn't have noticed it. But there is an airlock. It looks like it was the outs. It, it was um, a docking port of some freighter or other that's been repurposed, and it is currently closed. And very, very faintly, it looks like someone's tried to break the lights over it, so it's not obvious. But they've not managed to get all the LEDs out. There is the the very faint glow that shows that this is powered which is unusual for all the scrap around you, which is clearly, you know, rusting away and neglected. How do we want to do this? Obvious or carefully? I'm thinking, Jaren, we should talk, ask them to come out and talk, but I'm prepared to go any way we want to. I mean, I could... Um, do we want them out or in? Sorry. I mean, they're not... I don't believe they're the world's greatest thinkers. I could probably go over and ask them to let us in. This is their territory. If they ever come out, they could be a bit disruptive. We don't want it to be disruptive. They either stay in there or they leave completely. No, we're, we are we are dealing with them now. Hmm. But do you want to deal with them outside or inside? Axel looks around a bit. Out here there is more space. That is true. I don't mind. I'm good in either space. If they have any wisdom amongst them, they'll have set traps inside. Or at least use the bottleneck to give themselves a longer chance of survival. But that's if they have any wisdom. They're not the cleverest of people, but they are good at what they do. Any the idea where their um, alternative exit would be? I'm not sure they'd even have one. Ma said, as far as she knew, they'd only managed to clear out one of the engine exhausts. Yeah, this looks like a lot of work to open. I don't think they are focused enough to get a second exit. I mean, it's a spaceship. Can we break the spaceship? The ship itself is buried underneath the piles of scrap. Okay. It's not like an extant spaceship that's outside that you can go... It's basically a mountain of junk and rock and rubble and ruined craft and dropped scrap with this airlock that has been... Okay, so first thing, Oberon, you need to have a look around and see if you can see if they can see out the approach. If there's any entrances there or lookouts that they can do. I would like to um, tactically assess, please. Is that another warfare rule? Yeah, I think it will be. Your difficulty is two purple, and I'm going to give you a setback because of the scrap. You know, it's a little bit awkward to try and work out what is purposeful and what is not purposeful. That's a wash except for one crab vantage. So you can see where you would set up lookouts if you were staking this place out, but you don't know if they have. The problem with out here is there's lots of places they could hide if they wanted to, and lots of places they could set up cameras if they wanted to, but you can't pinpoint if they have or if they haven't. It is not your environment for hunting. You have mostly been trained how to do it in cities and in jungles and the wilderness. This kind of twisted scrap metal, it's just a little bit out of your wheelhouse. Once you sorted out what you want to do with your advantage, I have an idea. I'd like to pass my advantage to Mim, so I'd like to be able to point out like a like a port or a device or something, and I'll just shrug and go Honestly, they could have done anything here. Though there is a there is an access port over there. Would I be... If they've got cameras, 
or anything elec- uh, anything computerized, would I be able to, uh, using my data slate, try and pinpoint it or get it to ping? If I kind of do a, a wide access search and look for anything that is accessible, see if they've uns- you know if there's any Bluetooth devices that you can connect to, kind of thing. And if there's anything that is turned on in this scrap yard, anything that actually is is still using power is potentially something that could be hacked into. Okay. I'm going to say yeah. I want you to make me a computer's roll. I want you to roll your force rating as part of this. I'm flipping a dark side point, and your difficulty is going to be one red, two purple, and a setback. Because I think you're pushing your technology beyond what it's designed for, but you do have that force link to technology. Okay. Any forced points you you generate can be spent on either successes or advantages. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, that's two dark side points if I want to use them. Do it. If you do, you don't have to flip to use them. You just take a strain and I will mark you up a conflict. Oh my, it is basically one disadvantage. So I'm going to use those dark side points, I think. To give you a success and an advantage to cancel out the threat? Yeah. She she is 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 grumpy. She's very one-minded. She's uh, yeah. She's not thinking nice thoughts. You start running a few snooper programs on your data slate, kind of looking out to see if there's any um, Wi-Fi signals, effectively, <laughs> or Bluetooth devices that you could potentially connect to. That sort of thing. And from your data slate, it doesn't seem to be picking anything up at first. And this is frustrating you, because this is definitely the place that you were told that they were. There's definitely some power going to this thing, because you can almost feel that there is power going to this airlock, you know? And you get kind of grumpy, and you scowl at your data slate, and you you press the buttons to run the program again, maybe bashing it a little bit harder than you otherwise would. And you flex a muscle in your mind that you kind of keep forgetting that you have sometimes and your data slate fizzes and then suddenly it's picking up a signal. So there is power going to the airlock, there is the you know the, the keypad outside to open and close it, but it looks like when they've run power to it they have missed what was another access point to open that door, which is buried in some of the scrap, but you can probably unearth that You also pick up that there are two cameras that have been hidden around here, keeping an eye on the entrance. At the point where you are, you have not yet come into those cameras' field of view, but you know where they are. Right. I've had an idea. To show character growth, I'm going to run it past you rather than just do it. So, um, what if you all find yourself some decent outside here ambush point, and I'll go and knock on the door, and then run back this way? Because they will want to speak to me, probably quite violently. I guarantee, if I knock on the door, they will come out and chase. Alright. There's a camera over there, and a camera over there, from what I can figure out. So she points those out to everybody. Mm -hmm. And just over there, I reckon... There's another access panel that I think I can use to control the door. Am I right in thinking that, Adam? Yep. So if you can get them out, I can shut the door so they don't get back in. Well, let's pull them into an ambush. And then if they don't go with chasing me, we can go in. Because they're going to see us on the way in. I think what I'd like for them to see is me walking up by myself. Me saying, I'm here to talk. They think I'm an, uh, an idiot who would do that sort of thing. So let's be an idiot who would do that sort of thing. And then, when I suddenly realise I'm out of my depth, as they have seen me be out of my depth several times, I will run away. And they, being hunters, being men of cruelty, will will chase. And they will chase me right through where you are. Okay? All right. So if we stay out the way of those cameras... Yep. I'm not going to go until you're in position, because I need to know where you are. I don't want to be running around this scrapyard waiting for you to leap if I've gone the wrong way. Overon picks a spot. Do you want me to make a stealth roll now or later, Adam? Let's do it now, because I'm assuming you're gonna. You, you can get one outside of the scope of the cameras, but I suppose it's whether or not you'll be obviously visible when they come out. So yeah, make me a stealth test. 
it is going to be standard difficulty of two purple. I'm going to give you a boost because this time the kind of jagged and mismatched terrain will be working to your advantage. So are we all taking one? No, at the moment I've got something for you to do, Agatha. Okay. Let's see, the ambush point is going to be about here, considering where he is hiding, right? Okay. I would like you, before we get to the cameras, to take that big piece of scrap there and move it so I can run around it so I'm not running away from men with guns with clear sight of me. Okay. I'd like to have a little bit of cover from my run. Adam, that's one success and six advantage. Wow. Yeah, you get up there and bed yourself in. What would you like to do with those advantages? I would like to have figured out points where I can, if I want to, I can knock stuff down, like yeah, yeah. with a single shot, uh, and essentially um, use the advantage to have area control. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's call that three, which is effectively if you need to start introducing story aspects to the scene for you to do cool stuff with, you have that permission. Basically, you know, without having to define exactly now what it all is. Yeah. So let's say that's three. What would you like to do for your other three? Uh, I'm going to save those so I can get a dead shot, like so I can get free boost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for yeah, for your first shot, you get them wrapped up because you're drawing a bead on the doorway. Yeah. Absolutely fine, mate. Ross. I was about to suggest whether you wanted because you're going to be looking at where their lines of fire are going to be as they come out as well. Whether you wanted to assist with where I should place cover for Jaren in any way to give some advantages to him as he roos out of the way. I just want a big piece of junk in the way, so when they're behind me, they don't have a clear shot on me. Yeah, it might not be necessarily a thing we need to spend an advantage on. I'm tapping O'Bron's experience in that case. I'm quite happy for that just to be part of the scene. Okay. And also, I don't need you to roll um, Agatha because Agatha is really strong Hmm. and is force-powered strong if he wants to be. You dragging basically some cover for Jiren to get behind that is also big enough for you to hide behind as well if you want to lie in wait there. I am absolutely happy with that. Yeah. There is enough junk and hull plates and broken bits of stuff here that you can do that without a problem whatsoever. All right. Cracking with dead shots then. Lassa, is there anything particularly you want to do at this stage before Joren goes in and starts trying to... Not really. She's a bit numb at the moment. What's she armed with, if anything, at the moment? Definitely a pistol. (laughs) <laughs> definitely a pistol yeah we haven't taken that offer yet <laughs> no no I've still got it it is a holdout blaster okay that's what I've got that's it really she's just she's she's there and she's got a pistol Lassa do you want to hide ambushes work better if you're hidden right yeah um I, I, I'll just duck down behind here and she finds somewhere where generally she's hidden but it's not particularly strategically great or anything it's just there is a thing she gets behind it <laughs> I don't think I want a stealth test from you because I kind of get the, the impression that Lass is not actually trying to hide hide. She just wants to get out of immediate line of sight and doesn't really care if when they're out they'll be able to see you because am I right in thinking that or do you want to make a stealth test to try and bury yourself in a bit better? Or It's not so much not caring. She's just not quite with it at the moment. Yeah. She's simply not with it, which means she, she knows what she has to do. She has to get hidden. So she finds something to hide behind, but it's not great cover or not a great place to shoot from it's simply she's working very much on the basic premises of don't be seen okay so they can't, if I can't see them they probably can't see me I come to the rest of the party everyone's concentrate on staying alive Agatha's going to put on his vibro knuckles because you know this is going to be a proper scrap but he's wondering at the moment because he, he does actually have a pistol the fact that he doesn't use it is beside the point he's wondering whether to pass that to Lassa or not in case she needs a spare <laughs> I think I'm going to put it down near to where she is, because I think she's distracted at the moment. That way she can see it. Yeah, okay. And mostly I'm going to be keeping her, keeping Lassa alive as well. I'm going to special, pay special focus here. Thank you. All right then, Mikey. So, Jiren stands there for a second, takes a couple of very deep breaths, puts on a almost kind of the original... When you first met him on Daxos, that sort of grin. Yeah. And walks out in the view of the cameras down directly and walks towards the airlock he's not hiding himself he's not paying attention to any of the cameras he knows are there get to the airlock and he's going to ring the doorbell step way back way back hey he says and onto the comm before he steps back 
I'm here. I imagine you want to talk to me. I've come alone, but we have Bosco. You'll move and step back. A few very tense minutes pass. Because I imagine you're just standing there until something happens or until you get bored. Yeah, I think the boredom's going to hit first. It's only a couple of minutes and then slowly the airlock doors slide open. And you can see that there are a couple of crates that have been dragged up to just behind the airlock. About five foot high and a couple of feet wide. The airlock's quite big uh, and quite wide. You know, it's designed for almost like um, speeders to come in and park. It's you know, it's not a it's not a a a small person porthole. It is a decent sized doorway, and you can see leaning out from around those crates, holding blasters, are three of the crew led by a Nikto that you recognise named Hyron, who, again, was one of your... was one of the, the Bosco faction. Yeah. Looking down this tunnel, it's, it's a reasonably long tunnel, and you can see that at strategic points down this tunnel, there have been bits of scrap placed to provide effectively chest-high walls. Yeah. Leaning on a video game trope. And at the end of the tunnel, you can see where there was another set of doors that, that aren't there anymore, leading into one larger opening, possibly what maybe was the cargo hold of this place. And you can see movement in there as well. In fact, you're a chiss, you can see the dark, can't you? Yeah, I can. The other three crew members are down that end, also with blaster carbines, peering around to see what happens. I'm going to take a few steps back and possibly using my deception make it look like I, it's dawned upon me that this is possibly not the best of ideas and then then just as a micro expression and then just go straight back and go I am unarmed we have your captain we we need you to leave this place it is up to you here is my ultimatum you decide to leave we talk I take a few steps back again just to indicate that maybe I am talking my way around something and I'm not particular I want them to think, Jiren's done this thing again, he's made a mistake, he's stepped into a place he's not ready for, and now he's suddenly doubting himself. Because that's what they'll think, I think. So, I'm go- and then a few more steps back. I am unarmed, I say again, and for that, I want, basically, for them to chase me. Make me a deception test. I'm flipping a dark side point. Your difficulty is a single red. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah. That's four advantage, no successes and free dark side well I am leading them into a trap yeah hmm and you are lying to them and I am lying to them so does it cost me more conflict to use all of them yeah so for every dark side point you draw on it's one conflict one strain I think we'll just draw on one of them to make me an, uh, to make it successful so then we will dr- tap into one of them and I have four advantage and one success okay Hyron who is clearly the leader now that Bosco's gone, is exchanging glances with the others, and it looks like they might be coming out. He's clearly working up to say something, but he's taken a little bit off guard. What would you like to do with your advantages? Because you wanted to draw at least this group out into the open, didn't you? I want them to think that they have the advantage here. I want them to think that I have done something that I didn't, uh, something reckless and foolhardy like they expect me to do. I want them to think that my plan was to come up here, talk to them, and get them to leave. Because I am overconfident and I think that's a possibility. I want them to potentially send more people out after me because their guard is down than they would have expected. So, really, you could send out one person and get me because I'm not a physically intimidating man but I would like those advantages to go into their overconfidence and them to send out more people. So I think, for two of those advantages, this whole group of three will come out into the open to try and get you. Yeah. But that still leaves you two advantage. I would like to spend those two advantages to a manoeuvre to bolt. Once I realise I've, I've drawn them in, run and get them to chase me. And just to give me a little bit of, um, of distance between them. Yep, yeah, okay. So Hyron kind of nods to these other two and makes his way out. He's going, uh, Satan, 
Thou are eat stupid for come here alone. We's gone to take ye and get the boss back and turn thee in. Earth is a bounty on your head now, wee boy. Come on, lads, rush him. Uh, and they, I mean, they're, they're carrying carbines, but they're not, they don't aim and then shoot at you. They are clearly running in uh, with them gripped as if to try and either to to hold you down or to hit you with the butt mm-hmm. um, to try and knock you out. Those three kind of move out into the open after you. Yeah. And you rabbit. Yeah. And I assume that you rabbit round the corner to where Agatha is. That's right. Okay. And I'm not going to stay where Agatha is. I'm going to run past him so they focus on me rather than they might even run past Agatha so he can get swiping. Yeah. I think I'm going to need initiatives, but I'm going to give everybody a boost. So I imagine we're going off cool rather than vigilance. Yes, it will be a cool test. Five successes, two crowd advantage, and four light side points. Look at that. Look at that. Just look at that. Obviously, with the light side points, I, that basically means that everyone gets bonus action, pretty much, with my uh, force powers. Nice. And that also means they all, because they're all getting bonus actions, they all also get defense two for the first round, don't they? Yep. Nice. So, one success, six advantages. I've got two advantage and a triumph. Nice. How does that work? So, well, that just means that you go first. Certainly, that's how I roll it. Okay. It doesn't matter how many successes anyone else got a triumph, you go first. And get a free manoeuvre. So you're likely to be getting two free manoeuvres as you're moving preternaturally quickly. And Mim? One success, two advantage. So, it is a player character, one group of minions, a player character, the second group of minions, two player characters. Who wants to go first? All of you have a free manoeuvre to either aim or to move or similar. And then the first person to go has a second free manoeuvre because of Ross's triumph. Doesn't it have to be Ross that does that? Oh, yes. Yes, it does. Sorry, yes. So, yeah, Ross, you, you have a second free manoeuvre. Ross, do you want to go first? I don't want to get in the way of your shot. Adam, how far away are they from me? So I've moved back and then moved back again. So the group that are pursuing you are probably short range at this point because they've kind of moved up to follow you as you've bolted. I did use advantages to get further away from you. Yeah, but relative... this Call it medium then, relative distances. So they're medium from you, from Agatha and from Mim and they are also medium from Ed but in a different direction because he's up at an advantage point. The second group of minions are at a short range from the doorway, so they're at long from everyone else, but you'd have to move down to get a clear shot. Okay, so if they're at medium, I'm happy somebody else having a go for them to react, because they probably... Well, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. I might get shot, but we'll see. I was going to suggest that I go for goal, then myself go, because we're basically going at the same time. Quite frankly, I don't want to go first or second, I want to go last. Okay, well, I'm going to deal with the group at medium range. The group that are out in the open? Yeah. Because the other group are down the tunnel. So, yeah, the group that are out in the open, yep. Yeah, let's deal with the, the first threat, I and mean, then we can come up with the tunnel shortly afterwards, because that'll be funny. Agatha is going to start using the force powers, because he can. Are you going to move in, use your force power, and then move in? Because if you're doing it from medium range, it would require at least three pips. Yeah, I'd like to move to short range if I can. I don't know if I can aim. You can because you've got two free manoeuvres. One that's from your Triumph and then a super snacky bonus one you're not normally allowed to have from Oberon's Widdly Force Powers. So you've effectively got three manoeuvres, which I'm sure is possible. It might not be how the rules work, but I don't care. It's fine. It makes good TV. So you, you can move, aim, use your force power and then move in again or move back or double aim I'll see what happens once I try hitting them. but yeah I'm going to be using hurl power because I have force move to that extent so control hurl allows me to hurl objects to damage targets by me and this is going to be fun because I'm going to hurl one of the members of the group into one of the other members of the group because they are an active target it's a ranged combat check that uses discipline difficulty is equal to what you're moving uh, which is silhouette one so it's two purple die and you need to generate at least two force pips to use it. For the force users out there, the good news is two dark side points. Well, it's the way we're going, isn't it? It seems to be, yeah. Have you succeeded, first of all? I have succeeded. It's five success, no advantage. Five success, no advantage? Yeah. Crikey. Tell you what, I'm not going to use the dark side points. You have to, otherwise you can't use the power. Ah. 
Yes. Sorry, I, I have to use both of outside points because that's the thing, isn't it? Well, that's what we're doing. That's two strain for using the power. The base damage is 10, plus five for your successes. Yeah. That will take two of this group of three out completely. So what does that look like? Agatha is running forward with basically his, his hands outreached. I mean, I imagined that when Agatha thought he was going to do this and thought, you know, let's channel this and try and do this without grievous amounts of blood everywhere, he thought, okay, I'm just going to hurl, pick one of them up and throw them back into the second one. The first one is lifted off the ground very much against their will and is thrown bodily back into the second of their friends. Heads are cracking and Agatha, I mean, he's at short range already, so technically he's in... I don't think he needs to run away at this point. He's quite happy being his third. So move in to engage then. Yes, please. Okay, okay. The other group at the moment are still down the tunnel and out of sight at this moment in time. The next group to go is the minion that you're engaged with. The pirate you're engaged with looks with horror and shock at what you've just done to two of his friends. Staggers backwards as their manoeuvre, levels their carbine and just unloads at you at point blank range with their blaster carbine. Okay. So that is that is one success but four threat. Okay. So that's 10 damage before soak as they just, like, hose you down with blaster fire at point blank range. But that is four threat. That is a considerable amount of threat. What do you want to happen for that threat? I'd recommend, really simply, just give them some uh, some soak damage because they're panicking. You know, just basically damage them directly like you would do with threat on us. Yeah, just hit them for full strain. Yeah, that's the one. I mean, do we want him to be screaming loud enough that the guys still coming at the tunnel think twice about it? Well, we need them out here, but we can always open it up if need be. Well, in that case, do we want him to be screaming extremely and weakly so they don't warn him at all? They can see what's happening. Yeah, you just jumped out and did stuff. Yeah, and threw two of their friends together without touching them. Just hadoukened them. Yeah, this is what I wasn't doing in the arena. <laughs> in his flailing, he could um, jam the door using Star Wars logic. He's not right next to the door, unfortunately. But he's got a carbine and he's blasting away and Star Wars door logic. I'm happy if you want to spend two of those threats, Star Wars door logic, the door open so that the pirates down the tunnel can't close it. Yeah, I love that that's a verb. And then maybe give them a setback die because they've suddenly realised that they are trapped. Let's do that. So yeah, the minion group that's not acted yet, give them a setback die because they're all like, holy criff. Yeah. So, next PC. Can I go? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I've got a, an additional manoeuvre, so I'll spend that on aiming. Yep. That gives you four boost for your pinpoint shot. Yeah. That's a lot of dice. And it's medium range, you say? It is, yeah. Okay. The other option, just before you roll, is rather than using your manoeuvre to aim, either of your manoeuvres to aim, you could take your shot, and then if this minion drops, use your free manoeuvre and your normal manoeuvre to get down on the ground. Because from your point of view, you won't be able to see anyone down the tunnel. That's totally what I'll do. Three successes, six advantage. Like one of those was a light side point, but I just turned it into an advantage. Uh, sorry, into a, into a success. That does trigger the crit. You don't need to. This, this is just one person, and that amount of damage will take them out straight away. Okay, and then I will use the grapnel in my armour to repel down. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. That could be your manoeuvre, so you've still got six advantage to play with. Wow. So, literally, I aim, aim again with the, the repel, crack off the shot as I'm coming down. So, literally, like, I'm following the bolt as I come down, because that just looks cool. I land, basically, it's a hero landing, because, again, that looks cool. This pirate just drops the ground by your feet as you land from your bolt going through him. So, six advantage, I have them completely covered down the hall. Like, I have, again, zone control of the rifle. And because this is going split second, that's going to give them serious disadvantage to anything, really. Because, like, they're aware that I can just shoot them again. As in, when they're trying to come out. So, it's but it's a more setback dice, essentially. Because there's nowhere they can run to before they get to me where I can't have shot them. Because they're not a team, because they're all minions, they're like trying to not be the first person through the door. It's their turn next. Yeah. And I think that what they're going to do is shout down the corridor, We're sorry, we surrender, please don't kill us! And you see them throw their blasters to the floor. And I think that's what they're, that's what they're going to do for their turn. They're staying in cover as best they can, although effectively, Ed, you have negated any cover they may have because between those advantages and your previous setup, effectively, you can just RoboCop 
blaster bolts down here and ricochet them off the walls, but they have thrown their blaster carbines down and are crying that they're going to surrender. And that's their turn. Can I go next? Yeah, of course you can go next, because they've just asked to surrender and it's like, oh. Yeah, I'd like to get a word in edgeways before you pop them. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jiren, while Agatha steps out, sort of stops running and stops gone to a jog. And as Agatha turns, goes past him, turns round and starts walking back down the corridor with his arms out. They announce they are surrendering, and um, I'm going to use my... I've, I've still got an extra manoeuvre, haven't I? From, uh, so, to walk up twice, so I'm in short range of them, open my arms and go, This is your captain speaking. Come out with your hands up. And that's where we're going to end the episode. Thank you to my players for playing. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners, for listening. Our listeners, not mine. You do not belong to me. You're a collective resource, loved equally by all of us here. Thank you so much for being with us, and we will see you next time. Force Majeure is played using the Star Wars Force and Destiny game system by Fantasy Flight Games and Lucas Books. Our intro music for this season is Unholy Night by Kevin MacLeod, and our outro music remains Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale, both used with gratitude under the Creative Commons license. If you like the show and want to interact with us, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, all of which are at Force Majeure Pod though Twitter is probably where you're going to find us more regularly. If you enjoy what we do and want to support the show, there's three ways you can do that. The first is via our Patreon at patreon.com slash force majeure pod. The second is by buying us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash force majeure pod. And the third way is by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere where you can find us. We really like reviews. It tells us that we're telling the stories that you want to hear and helps other people find us. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time.